Welcome to the Next Moto Champion Talk Show. I'm your host, Danielle Teal. The latest issue of Next Moto Champion Magazine featuring Moto America's KTM RC Cup top contenders is out and available for your downloading pleasure. This month features regular segments like the Instagram page, product spotlights, and much more. And the best part, it's free. Now for the news. AMA Pro Flat Track has officially wrapped up the 2016 season, and while the number six Brad Baker ran away with the show, it was the number 42, your new Grand National Champion, Brian Smith, who took the season. It was one of the most thrilling battles I've ever seen that came all the way down to the line. After making an end of the race surge, Mies passed Smith, only to be passed back, sealing the number 42's first Grand National Championship of his career. Brian went on to say, if a racer ever said that he's gave it everything on the last lap or last corner, I'd call him a liar because that was everything I had inside of me, Smith said. The grips were falling out of my hands, my feet were falling off the pegs, and I could not hold on, so thank God it worked out. If you'll remember, AMA overturned the ruling on Smith's disqualification, which allowed him to re-enter contention for the championship. Congratulations to him, and thank you, AMA Pro, for allowing the top two riders, Mies and Smith, to duke it out all the way until the end. Here's a look at the overall point standings for AMA Pro Flat Track 2016. Moving on, MotoGP. Points leader Marc Marquez has taken another win at Motorland Aragon, extending his championship lead ahead of Valentino Rossi and Jorge Lorenzo. Next up, the twin ring Motegi, where Marquez will sit 52 points ahead going into a track that he won back in 2014. Let's take a quick look at MotoGP point standings going into round 15. And a quick congratulations to KTM's Brad Binder for taking the Moto3 championship. And on to World Superbike and on to MagniCore, where Kawasaki's Jonathan Ray will hopefully continue his winning ways as there are 50 points available if he does a repeat of last year and does the double again this year. But don't rule out Chaz Davies to be a big spoiler for the weekend after his dominant victory from the German round and a podium at MagniCore last year. Let's take a look at the point standings going into round 11. And that brings us to Moto America. As you all know, Moto America's wrapped up its 2016 season, and we congratulated all the champions on the last show. But this week, we have the privilege of being joined by Moto America partner Chuck Axglin to discuss how the 2016 season went from the inside and moving forward. And he's going to answer some of your submitted questions right here. So stay tuned. Also on today is Vice President of the AIM Expo, here to talk about next week's much anticipated event, Larry Little. Press releases from the weekend and so much more are all available at nextmotochampion.com. We've got more for you, but first, let's hit a quick commercial break. still feeling generous it's giveaway time we've given away a speedway motorsport shelter two sets of bridgestone tires an american cargo backpack a capit cover and helmet dryer and this month it's a cargo tire repair kit by grip available by speedmob.com all you have to do is sign up for the weekly newsletter at the front page of nextmotochampion.com and the winner could be you good luck 
All right, are you looking for a little more adventure in your life? Do you want to know how to turn your motorcycle into an adventure touring motorcycle? Well, in this week's Product Spotlight, John Boucher and Jeevy are going to show you how. Watch this. So when you're talking about adventure touring, aftermarket parts and accessories, there's one company that since 1978 has been designing and developing parts specifically for that purpose. And that company is GV. And when you think about GV, you automatically start to think about those nearly indestructible side cases that they make. And side cases are first and foremost, the first piece to adventure touring. So when you go on a trip, you're gonna want enough cargo space to carry everything you need for a week, maybe two. The Outback series are black powder coated aluminum cases that come in two different sizes, 37 liters and 48 liters. They come in different sizes because it depends on where your exhaust is on your motorcycle. The smaller case is gonna go on the exhaust side. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is install this tubular mounting system for the Outback series and they've made some improvements here. There's uh, additional mounting points, there's also additional contact points when it comes to where the bag's actually gonna attach and the tubing is actually even a little bit thicker for this Outback series. So you can see here where we pre-installed our mounting brackets. So on the left side, we're gonna install the 48 liter Trekker Outback case. And for just a little more room, we're installing this 15 liter cargo bag that attaches directly here to the top. Now, since this is the BMW R1200GS, we have our exhaust on the right-hand side, which means that the right side is getting the 37-liter black aluminum Trekker Outback. Now, two side cases might not be enough cargo space for everyone, which is why we're installing our aluminum plate top case mounting hardware. This is our 42 liter Trekker Outback top case and it's gonna secure right here to our mount with these three points. Now, if you're doing adventure touring the way that it's supposed to be done, then you're almost guaranteed to have your bike fall over at some point, which is why we're installing the GV stainless steel engine guards. Now, these stainless steel engine guards are 25 millimeters in diameter, which means you can accessorize them with foot pegs and other accessories. Engine guards are also available in a flat black finish. So out of all these pieces that we're putting on the bike, these engine guards are really gonna be your best investment pieces because look, you're protecting what's most valuable. This bottom one is gonna protect the engine, then up top you have uh, body work, some plastic, even uh, your radiator right here on the inside, and that's what this upper engine guard is gonna protect you from. So some very, very smart pieces from GE. So now that we've installed our upper and lower engine guards, our next step is gonna to be to put in this GV skid plate. Now, you've got this beautiful titanium exhaust system, which is what this skid plate will protect. It's also gonna protect the lower part of your engine. So if you ever put your kickstand down in dirt, gravel, or mud, and had your bike fall over, then you're probably gonna be a big fan of this next piece. This is a kickstand adapter and what it does it just gives you more space so if you run into any of that gravel or mud uh, you're not going to have as much of a chance as your kickstand going straight into it. Now everyone knows that a tank bag is an essential part to any adventure touring motorcycle and what GV's done is actually really smart. They've eliminated the magnets and the straps and they've invented this tank lock system. So now that we have our tank lock mount installed, all I have to do is just clip my bag on. To pop it off, just hold that little red lever. If you're looking for a place to hold your GPS phone or really any tech device, then you're gonna wanna install the aluminum smart bar. The smart bar is designed to work with any 7 8 mount and it keeps you from reaching your pocket to look at your phone or GPS. So after spending some time behind your OEM windshield, you might find out that it doesn't have nearly enough coverage, which is why GV has made this aftermarket windshield that's higher and wider. So if you're a little bit taller and this windshield doesn't give you total coverage, you can get additional coverage with this Shield Plus attachment. Here's a quick recap of the GV parts and accessories that we put on our BMW R1200GS. We started with the tubular side case mounts for our Trekker Outback side cases. From there, we installed our top case mounting hardware and our 42 liter Trekker Outback top case. 
we installed our lower engine guards to protect our engine and our upper guards to protect our fairing, radiator, and bodywork. Knowing we're gonna come across some rocky terrain, we installed our GV skid plate to protect our exhaust and lower engine. A tank bag is a necessity for any adventure touring bike, so we installed our tank lock tank bag system from GV. We wanted to make it easy on ourselves to view our GPS or our phone, so we put on GV Smart Bar. Last but not least, we installed our GV aftermarket windshield and Shield Plus attachment. Now, if you need additional information on any of these awesome GV adventure touring products, you can go to GVUSA.com. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Fastest Motorcycle Show. Woodcraft-CFM.com is your made-in-the-USA aftermarket parts specialist when it comes to rear sets, clip-ons, sliders, engine covers, and more. Woodcraft is the exclusive distributor of brands like Armor Bodies, Cycle Mount, and new for 2016, Hindle Exhaust, a combination of power, quality, and value that you won't find anywhere else. Find them all at woodcraft-cfm.com. K&N Performance Air Intake Systems. For more airflow in, more horsepower out. Guaranteed. So, how fast does this thing go? Depends on who's in the sidecar. It's pretty comfortable in there. Let's go for a ride. All right. Definitely misread this one. Nyko Motorcycle. Great rates for great rides. Swing in a minute. And we're back in the second season of Moto America is officially in the history books and now 2017 is on the horizon. There's still questions and concerns and we have Moto America partner Chuck Axlin here to answer them. Welcome to the show, Chuck. Hey, Danielle. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and and uh, hopefully there's a lot of good questions and not so many concerns. Oh, very good point. And we're happy for the opportunity to have you on and get some of these questions answered. Um, there obviously, there's a lot we could talk about. We're going to try to stick to some of the more pressing issues per your audience and our audience. Um, but let's start with this. Two seasons under your belt, and hopefully you feel like progress has been made this season. Um, it's been a few weeks since the end of 2016 season officially. Uh, how would you say you guys ranked in terms of Moto America expectations? You know, when uh, myself and Wayne and Richard and Terry, you know, ventured into this a couple of years ago, we, we, you know, we're in it for the long term. We knew it was a long term project and, and we kind of laid out some steps, you know, kind of a, a map really. And the first thing was to try and get rules stabilized, try and get, you know, some, some confidence back with racetracks and, and build the schedule for more than more races than what it had. Uh, we knew that, you know, to, you know, to uh, become um, relevant again, it needed some TV. So the first year, obviously, we had the, the deal with CBS Sports Network. And um, um, so that was the start. You know, the, the rules are always going to evolve a little bit, but we're inching closer to world superbike rules. You know, we announced this year that the that the superbike uh, category will be world superbike spec bikes. So we're, we're, we're there, basically. And then we we were able to bring uh, Beyond BN Sports, um, you know, into the fold for this year with the live TV coverage, and they've done an excellent job. Um, we're really happy with the coverage they provide and the exposure they're given to our sport. So, so our our goals for next year really are just to continue to build build value in the sport. We need to make the events more than just races, and um, you know, pr promote those events in, in that way. And that's a, that's a lot of work. That's probably the the biggest box we got to check, but. You know that's going to involve all of our sponsors, all of our partners, all of our fans. You know we got to get the word about word out about road racing here in America and uh, get some people back at the racetrack and build value back in the sport. So uh, I think we're on the right track. We have good momentum. We talk to the manufacturers that aren't participating in the sport quite often, and um, they all are very favorable about what we're doing. So. So I don't know really what more we could do, but um, like I said, it's it's a. It's a long process, and we're, and we're ready for it. So, Well, and you covered so much there, and we're going to elaborate on a couple of those subjects later in the show per um, the request of our fans. Um, but let's talk, keep talking as Moto, uh, about Moto America as a whole, rather. Um, considering the task at hand, 
You guys had a big undertaking, obviously, but you, the fan base, a big discrepancy with the old management was the disconnect between the paddock and the management. How would you say you guys are doing two years in at this point with bridging that gap between management and the paddock and their concerns? Well, I think that's probably a good question for the paddock um, more than more than us. I mean, Wayne and myself really are, are paddock guys. We grew up in the paddock. You know, we were both racers. Uh, we both run teams. So, so we we understand the probably more so than than the um, you know the DMG guys. Um, I'm not going to say more so, but just maybe in a different way. We have a different outlook because we have participated in many different ways ourselves, and and now we're charged with running the series. So, I think uh, the relationship between us, the riders, the teams, um, for the most part, is very positive. Um, you know, we we rarely hear any any negativities and. And you know we're we're visible in the in the paddock. We're we talk to a lot of people. We uh, you know we we you know we enjoy that part of it. We enjoy walking around and seeing how guys are doing, and and we love the racing. So you know that's what we've been involved in our, all our lives, and and I think that reflects from the way we look at uh, our race direction, our track safety, and and what we're trying to do to build the sport. Well, I remember uh, personally that you came and introduced yourself to me in 2014 at New Jersey Motorsports Park, and that's resonated with me ever since. However, I'm not a racer or a team <laughs> owner, but I appreciated that very much. And I think it speaks tremendously in terms of your approachability and your transparency in the paddock at this point. Um, let's give a little credit well, like to I, like, I, like I mentioned, Daniel, we're, we're all in this together, and it's not just it's just not you know Wayne and I and our partners trying to build this up. It's, it's uh, all of us trying to, to build this up for every everybody's benefit. Uh, and I feel that totally, and I hope others do as well. Let's give a little credit to the other members of uh, Crave Group, uh, the other partners, Richard Varner, motorcycle manufacturer, entrepreneur, philanthropist, businessman, Terry Cargis, a former motorsports marketing exec, and team owner who spent 17 years at Roush Racing. So all of, obviously all of you guys have, and Wayne and yourself included, have uh, an experience that's tremendous. But let me ask you, Chuck, uh, a personal question for you as a former racer, team manager, rider manager, and uh, motorsports oriented businessman how do you know which interests uh, take preference for the riders team owners uh, the wants and needs versus necessities well it's um, we don't look at it as just one thing you know it's it's all of it together uh, you know riders have their concerns and, and, and issues and teams have theirs and and uh, Moto America as a series has has theirs you know there's there's issues with the tracks that we race at. There's issues with how do we build the sport so teams could gain more sponsorship. Um, you know, and, and, and the same goes for the series. You know, how can the series uh, evolve and get more spectators and develop more sponsorship there as well? So uh, it's not just one, one set thing. It's, uh, it's a number of issues, and we deal with them every day. And, you know, Wayne and I have an ongoing joke that, you know, every day is completely different. We'll wake up and there'll be something completely out of the blue from an angle you weren't expecting that, that hits you and, you, you know, you got to deal with it. And, you know, in part that makes it fun, but it makes it very challenging as well. Uh, sounds like uh, you've got to be prepared for just about anything, and I'm sure you guys are doing the best you can with all the curveballs be being thrown at you. Now, with that being said, and we know your foundation, we're going to dig into some of the issues presented by our fans uh, and address some of the questions that they had, and we're super thankful that they've sent um, in tons of great questions. And we're going to start with one of the biggest concerns. Are you ready for these questions? I'm ready. Let, her, let me have it. Let you have it. So one of the biggest concerns immediately upon you guys coming on board was in regards to the rules and the structure. And in 2014, you said long-term goal would be to align as closely with FIM world rules as possible. So tell the fans briefly how close you are. I, I heard something like within 5% to being right on, right on uh, line with World Superbike. Yeah, if you uh, if you kind of go down the list of the classes, superbike. I think the uh, the only difference that we have for next year is with superbike. There's a difference with world superbike. There's a difference in the gearbox. You you can nominate a set of ratios and then build that to run the the series to run the the, the series on. Uh, with us, we're going to maintain what we have now, which is use a standard uh, ratio. Other than that, suspension, electronics, um, you know, chassis, all the rules are the same. Uh, super stock 1000, 
is a little bit of a challenge for us right now, and that's just down to the number of super bikes. And you know, we want the the super stock 1000 guys uh, and that Bazaz super stock 1000 class to to be as competitive as they can against the super bikes. So we've adjusted rules there to allow them to make some uh, linkage and and offset changes and and uh, continue where they were with the electronics. And you know, right now the you know the base level stock. 1000 is very good so um i think we'll be able to move the super stock thousand guys up a little closer to the super bikes but in the future you know we we very much view that as um you know it should be more of an entry level class it shouldn't shouldn't be so close to uh to a full-on super bike which is you know this is probably one of the areas where the fim disagree with us and the direction we're going but it's really not by choice it's by necessity to to, to fill the grid uh, we are, you know, as, as we progress with the number of super bike entries, you know, our, our goal is to have a standalone super stock 1000 class. And hopefully we could do that in 2018. Well, that's great. That actually answers a couple of the questions submitted by um, race fans. Will there ever be a separation again? And that, that question was just answered. Well, with that being said, are we any closer to having some of the much needed manufacturers back in the paddock? Any, any word of that that we can get from you? Well, we... Uh, you know, like I said earlier, we, we have discussions with them, you know, probably biweekly with the majority of the manufacturers and, and the enthusiasm is there. It's just, you know, where we, where we started back in 2014, really there was no interest at that time with the ones that aren't involved. And, and it's not like you turn on a light switch and they're able to gear, you know, ramp up and, and, um, you know, start allocating budget towards the programs and all that. It, it takes time. And also, you know, we, we they had no idea what a couple of racers and their partners, if they're going to even be capable of, of running races. So, you know, now we're two two years into it. Um, I think um, uh, there is interest there from from several other manufacturers, and um, but it, it's really not for me to say when when they'll come in. But all I can say is the discussions are positive and. You know, as you saw last year, Honda stepped in as a commercial partner. They they sponsored three of our events and um, uh, gave away a car to Cameron Bouvier, which was a which was a great great prize at the end of their their challenge series. But uh, yeah, we're we're working on it every day, and and obviously that's another thing that will go a long way to, to generate fans and, and help promote the sport if the manufacturer more manufacturers are involved. Right, and at least progress is being made on that front, and we can only hope that they'll get back involved soon. Um, moving on to another structure-related question, a little different. Lane Smith asked, how is Crave interacting with club-level racing to help create a path to Moto America? Well, when we first took over the series, the AMA called um, you know, a meeting with the club members and, and ourselves. I think this was uh, the winter of 2014. It might have been early 2015, but, you know, we met with all the clubs. We have a good relationship with the clubs. And, uh, you know, just to let them know the direction we're going with the rules and, and encourage them to try and follow suit, especially with the lower categories, uh, you know, the Super Stock 600 and, you know, the Super Sport and, and the thousands. Um, so they're aware. We communicate with them. Uh, at Miller Motorsports Park or Utah Motorsport Campus, as it's known now, the uh, if you remember last year, we allotted some time on the race weekend for their local club, the USBA. So they had a standalone event within our event, and we're you know we're kicking around some ideas that hopefully we could continue that with a few other uh, tracks and clubs throughout next year. Great. Good to know. So obviously the next uh, on the list is pertaining to the schedule. Always a big concern. Uh, very simply asked by many, but by our, our viewer, Ryan McPherson, he wants to know, will we be visiting any new tracks for 2017? And this was actually asked by a ton of people, racers, team owners, <laughs> all sorts. So what do you say to that? Yeah, our, our goal, you know, when we started the, the uh, series, we thought nine races was appropriate appropriate and that was after getting feedback from team owners and and such because you know still the the economics don't really work out to just jump to a 16 race series so uh you know so we we kind of made it clear we wanted to have a minimum of nine and we'd like to to ramp it up year by year if we can next year uh, we look to have a 10 race schedule and and uh, what should be announced very soon and and involving that 10 race schedule will be two new tracks good to know you can't can't elaborate any more than that. Give us a little hint. 
I would rather let the schedule do the do the talk. Fair enough, fair enough. Had to ask. Um, obviously, in concerns with wanting to be able to race rain or shine, I'm sure that has something to do with your overall decision. But we actually had a lot of requests for bring back Mid Ohio, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Well, we've we've been in conversation with Mid Ohio since since we got involved in this. I mean, Danielle, when when we first announced the series, I think it was September third. Uh, the first task was uh, to September 3rd, 2014. The first task was to build the schedule, and and that week I, you know, I I barely talked to Wayne that week because I was on the phone to as many racetracks as possible. Uh, you know, Mid Ohio to us, um, you know, we stated early on that our goal was to race in the wet um, or try and you know try and take as the least amount of risk out so we could we could have a race regardless, and that's ever more important with the live television we have going on. Mid Ohio, you know, we've uh, we've told them if they're committed to repaving the track, we'd love to go back there. On to last the last uh, subject matter, um, but it's of equal importance. It's the TV package. You touched on it briefly in the beginning. Let's start with it. What can we expect for 2017? Well, you know, our TV deal with, with BN Sports really got signed the Friday of COTA weekend. And so it was like all hands on deck and everybody made it happen. And and uh, throughout the year, it was very much kind of, you know, getting to know each other relationship with, with us and, and the folks out of Miami. Um, they are very enthusiastic about what we're doing, um, very involved and um you know, I think they have some ideas for next year. You know, we've uh, obviously with the World Superbike going to a two-day format with Superbike races on Saturday and Sunday. Um, you know, part of our initiative, you know, from the beginning was to follow suit with World Superbike. And, and we kind of wanted to give that a year before, see how it worked out for them and, and um, ensure there are benefits before we made that swap. But I think we'll see, uh, see the majority of our races switch to the same platform. And, and really, you know, BN went from, from a couple hours of TV on a live TV on a Sunday to I think they were up to seven or eight. So uh, probably they were getting a lot of wives angry at their husbands for sitting in front of the TV watching Moto America all day Sunday and not doing stuff with the family. So, so I think next year you'll have shorter slots, but on a Saturday and a Sunday. And I think uh, it'll, it'll do wonders to improve the audience. And, and uh, hopefully we'll get more campers at the racetrack, too, watching the watching the, that new format. I think that'll make fans uh, very happy and racers uh, as well. Crew chief for Westby Racing, Chuck Giacchetto, said um, the package has been amazing this year. He liked it very much. But he wants to know, after hearing that our numbers and viewership is on course with being pretty good and comparable to MotoGP numbers, I don't know how accurate that is, but how close are we, is his question, to having a web-based series like Dorna? Do I have to answer questions from Chuck? <laughs> That's your call. He might come after you if you don't. But that was his question that he well, presented. Well, you know, again, that would be uh, that hasn't been discussed with with BN. There, there are a lot of ideas being kicked around. Uh, having a web based, I mean, BN do stream the um, the races that aren't shown on linear through BN Connect. So there is access to the to the to the races. You know, if you're not in front of a television set, so. I don't know if that's what if if um, it's not set up exactly the same as MotoGP or World Superbike, but but I think uh, access is there for anybody that wants to see our events, and and I'm satisfied with that right now. Very good. Good to know. So we are hopefully on track to having a better year next year than we even had this year. I'd say this year was even better than last. And we're making progress and hopefully on the upswing of things. Chuck, after it looking very dire there for a few years for us. Um, I know a lot of these questions, um, you know, allude to the fact that your fans have lofty aspirations for you. And I know that makes it a challenge, but it has to at least be a good thing, a positive thing to know that your fans are still on board and have big and great expectations for you guys. So what do you have to say to your fans that have stuck it out for you guys this long? No, well, it's, uh, you know, the support actually is amazing, you know, from the fans, from the from the paddock, from the manufacturers, you know, everybody, I think, you know, we get a good feeling that they're, everybody's rooting for us, uh, which is certainly positive. Um, you know, the, the we have our award ceremony at the AIM Expo uh, in conjunction with with them um, October 14th, and and fans are welcome to join us out there for our Night of Champions. Um, um, you know, the show is something that really shouldn't be missed. Um, a lot of new product there, and you get to mingle with our you know with our our, our stars and our champions. 
but um, you know Wayne and I and our other partners, we you know we hear at the racetracks the the thank yous and the you know and and you know really it's a bit humbling because we're we're in it because we want to see the sport better. We want to help create jobs. We want to bring jobs back. You know, when we were, when we were involved in the, you know, in the eighties, there were, there were a lot of full-time jobs that, that aren't there now. So, so part of that mission is to create that. And, and that's, that's going to take, like I said earlier, everybody involved, you know, the fan support and uh, getting people the racetrack and, and just, you know, we need to make the whole thing go around. Well, I'm pretty sure I saw Wayne Rainey signing some guy's head at New Jersey Motorsports Park, and he, <laughs> and he thanked him as he walked up. Thank you for bringing motorcycle racing back to this country. It's on, you know, it's on its way back up, and this guy was so thankful he had Wayne sign his bald head. But with that being <laughs> said, Chuck, congratulations on another successful season and on the third season, which is coming up in 2017. We wish you the best of luck, and thank you so much for coming on and answering the fans' questions today. No, it was a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see everybody at the races next year. And, um, you know, we're just trying to keep the momentum going and, and build, you know, year after year. And, and uh, I'm not sure when we'll achieve all our goals. Probably never. But as long as we're moving uh, forward, that's, uh, that's a good thing for us. Well, we're with you, Chuck. Uh, this is Chuck Asklin, partner with Moto America and avid motorcycling fan. He's here for the long haul, he said. Thank you so much, Chuck. We'll be right back with Larry Little from AIM Expo after this commercial break. Hi, I'm David Fisher. Briar Bauman. Brandon Robinson. Brad Baker. Corey Texter. And Kenny Coolbath. Dan Bromley. Shana Texter, and I run Evans Coolant. What I like most about Evans Coolant is I never have to worry about the bike overheating, so we're on, on the line. I uh, don't have to worry about overheating. In all my years of racing, I've never found a product that gives me the peace of mind to do what it's going to do like Evans. I run Evans Coolant. Evans Coolant. Evans Coolant. Evans Coolant. Coolant. Got to have the best to go fast. Next up, we have AIM Expo's Vice President, Larry Little. Don't go away. k and Performance Air Intake Systems. For more airflow in, more horsepower out. Guaranteed. And the 2016 AIM Expo is just a few days away. And we're happy to have on again this year industry expert and vice president of the AIM Expo, our friend Larry Little. Larry, welcome back to the show. Hey, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having us on. Of course, happy to have you. Uh, with just a few days left, I'm sure you guys are in a mad dash. How are you feeling? Oh, it's crazy, but you know, it's a good kind of crazy because there's always a great excitement with the uh, producing the expo and, and getting closer and closer and you know we're just just a few days away as you say so it's 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 a great time but a lot going on for sure <laughs> well you're in the home stretch the whole year leads up to this so i'm sure you're ready to get the thing going already just quickly for anyone who didn't get introduced to you last year on the show uh, i'm going to give them just a brief synopsis of your background just so they know uh you started with cycle news in 78 and soon thereafter began a 25 plus year tenure at cycle world and then became vp and publisher of the world's largest publication in 1990. Over the last uh, 18 years, you've been elected to the board of directors of the Motorcycle Industry Council and served 10 years as its chairman. So needless to say, you're overly qualified to be in this position. So with that being said, with all of your experience, at some point you made the assessment that we needed an AIM Expo. Why? 
Well, I tell the story, and it's it's a it's a pretty good story. I think when I first became publisher at Psycho World, I went over to Italy to the first my first ICMA show, which is the big Italian trade show that takes place in November. And both both as an enthusiast and a member of the media, I was just amazed at not only how many product introductions were being done over there, but how many consumers they got through the doors. But the thing that actually kind of grinded me just a little bit was the fact that there was a lot of product that was headed for the American market that was being introduced in Italy simply because we didn't have a platform for the media to see new product reveals in this country. So that was, you know, that was a major part of the moment motivation to to look at doing that kind of a platform in the U.S. And that's really what AIM Expo is. It's it's a platform for media introductions, for for trade trade visitors, the motorcycle dealers to see the new product, but then right away let the consumers see it also because at the end of the day, AIM Expo is the largest power sports uh, display you can find in the U.S. with you know 500 exhibitors with OEMs new models and all the aftermarket new models as well. Well, last year you called it a three-legged stool, uh, dealer attendees, consumer attendees, and media attendees. It seems kind of like a no-brainer, Larry. I mean, they're missing a huge demographic, the consumer, the people who spend the money, by isolating them out of this type of expo. So how important was it to you moving forward um, in your endeavor to c include the consumer, if nobody else? Oh, that's been extremely important because it, you know, this is a this is an industry and, and a market that's built on passion. And if you can let somebody sneak their nose under the tent just a little bit earlier than they otherwise would, you just feed that passion. And really, that's what that's what AIM Expo is about is really, you know, helping accelerate business in this industry, but also accelerating the passion for it as well. Right. And I was going to say, it has to bolster consumer morale to feel like they're getting a first look, you know, an invite into this otherwise industry, you know, industry portal where there's people with just the utmost knowledge about product and the people who are most passionate about it there to share it. Um, Let's see, our next question, I guess, last year there were, and there has been in the past as well, unveilings and all of these great incentives for consumers and industry people like to go and witness these types of global unveilings, as you called it last year. So can we expect anything like that this year? Absolutely. In fact, uh, on Thursday morning, just before the show officially opens at 10 a.m., uh, I can't say who just yet, but one of the major manufacturers is going to do a global reveal of a pretty pretty cool new bike that uh, everybody thinks is actually going to get introduced at Intermont, but it's actually not. It's going to be introduced at AIM Expo. So we're we're very excited about that. Plus, all there was a no whole other uh, slate of intros as well that we're going to see in our media hub at, at AIM Expo. But uh, I'm very excited. You know, the, the whole idea of, the plat of creating the platform was a lot for media introductions, and we're getting those, and we're very proud of that fact. Well, that sounds extremely exciting. I'm glad I'll be there for that. Um, last year, it was a Yamaha R3 along with a host of others. Uh, you had first-time manufacturers like BMW and Honda, which speaks profoundly for movement and progress in the U.S. in terms of these uh, OEMs getting back involved. What do you say moving forward? How, do, how would you say we're looking in terms of that kind of progress in our industry? Well, we're excited to have, uh, have KTM join us this year for the first time. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Aprilia and Moto Guzzi and Vespa join us for the first time this year, as, as well as a, a host of returning manufacturers. And the cool thing about it is, you know, a lot of them are going to be doing demo rides at AIM Expo Outdoors. And if there's one really cool thing about this year's show, especially for the consumers, is that we've moved into a different building on the Orange County Convention Center campus into the North Hall, which anyone that went to AIM Expo Outdoors remember having to take a shuttle ride. Uh, this year, we moved the show close right next door to where the outdoor demos are. So it's going to be real easy to just go swing open the door out of the exhibit hall, and you'll be right outside in the demo area. And uh, it's, it's really going to be a lot better for consumers, especially this year with that kind of a setup. We're really excited for the move. Very good. And KTM is one of our great sponsors. Happy to hear that they'll be, be there as well. Last year, there were bike builds. There were keynote speakers, seminars for the industry folk. What can we expect this year on the consumer side and the industry side? Well, a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, the AIM Expo Championship of the Americas Bikers Build Off Custom Bike Build is once again coming back. And there's going to be, I think, close to 50 custom builds like we had last year. It's amazing the ingenuity and creativity of some of the builders uh we've actually hooked up also with local guy jason paul michaels who's 
one of the founders of Dime City Cycles, he's just opened a co-op garage in Orlando called Standard Motorcycle Company, and it really is a a really good connection with the millennial crowd that's doing the new builds that you know they're they don't they can be any brand they don't have to be any any specific brand they can be any brand and so he's bringing that whole kind of millennial vibe with artisans i think we're going to have maybe even a tattoo guy a, a haircut guy so it's going to be it's going to be real it's going to be a cool vibe we got that uh the legends and heroes of supercross is coming back with their museum it People probably seen them at, at a lot of the super crosses that they've been, but they'll be as part of the show. Kenny Roberts Jr. is the AIM Expo show champion this year, so he's going to be down there. It's going to be great to have him as well. So there's a lot of things going on that uh, for the consumer especially. Uh, the AMA's Hall of Fame is going to take place on Thursday night, where this year's slate of inductees is going to be inducted into the hall, and you know Dick Burleson is going to be there. Their, their grand award uh, inductee this year. So that, and, you know, as, as, as Chuck from Moto America has, has said, the Moto America Night of Champions is on Friday night, and everyone is welcome to that. Even though the consumer portion doesn't start till su- Saturday, uh, everybody's welcome on Friday night to attend the Moto America Night of Champions. And, and we're really happy that, once again, they're coming down to do that because we're, we're real excited for that series and uh, haven't known Chuck personally for as long as I have in the whole group there. Uh, I'm happy to see the progress they're making. I can't wait to go. This will be my fourth time going, and I plan to continue going in Ohio in 2017. So let's move to the big news that came out recently, uh, the move to Ohio. Why? Most people say that when it's not broken, don't try to fix the thing, and Orlando seemed like a really great host venue for you. So why the move to Ohio? Well, it's a great question, and you know we spent some times listening to, the, especially the exhibitors at the show, and they really wanted to see a few more dealer trade visitors show up. And so, you know what, we looked around the country, and it turns out that you know there's a reason that the AMA is actually in in Ohio. It's because the greatest concentration of of motorcyclists in the country are within 500 miles of of Columbus, Ohio. And as it turns out, the same almost the same number of motorcycle brick and mortar retailers are within that a similar amount within 500 miles. So we're moving to Columbus because two things, we're going to be right in the smack dab middle of the highest concentration of dealers, but the, the, the convention center there, the greater Columbus convention center is undergoing a refurb and it is ultra modern. It is exactly the perfect size to house aim expo. So we'll take over the whole convention center. We'll own the whole town. The whole downtown is right. It's a downtown convention center. It's located right there. If you haven't been to Columbus in a while, the downtown has absolutely been cleaned up, revitalized. It's gorgeous. There's an arts district called the Short North that has over 100 restaurants and bars. It's a craft brew city. So it's the perfect place for motorcyclists and the motorcycle and power sports industry to go. It's our kind of town. We can go in and we can own the town. You had me at craft brew. But it sounds like a logical. It sounds like a logical explanation. Sounds very centrally located, um, with a lot of motorcyclists and passionate motorcyclists said that in the vicinity. Um, so it sounds good. I can't wait to try that out. The reviews from guys like uh, guys at Bell, head head guys at Bell, are are raving about it. So it sounds like a good plan, and I can't wait to see how that plays out. But for now, in Orlando this year, if they haven't got their tickets, they need to get them. They're super reasonable. Fifteen for a single day pass, twenty for both for two days. I mean, you guys really have packed so much for so little. I mean, I can't really say much more than that, except for they will get so much more for their money than they can even expect. Yeah, I, we do. I mean, that, one of the things is we just we want to make sure people have the opportunity to come in and have a look. And there's no reason with the family it should cost a lot of money. And we've, we've tried really hard to keep the cost down. And, you know, go to uh, AIMEXPOUSA.com, AIMEXPOUSA.com, and get your information on tickets. There's a a discount for buying them online. So, you know, take advantage of that. The tickets are on sale at the door as well. Yeah, and there's discount for groups, all sorts of incentives to go. And they don't price gouge in the Orlando area. So it makes for a nice little trip if you've got to make it work. Makes a little business and pleasure. It makes sense to me. I'm going, and I'll be going again next year as well. Uh, Larry, they can also download the app. Again, aimexpousa.com. It's Larry Little, the vice president of the AIM Expo. Can't wait to see you in a few days, Larry. Looking forward to it. Glad you're going to be uh, joining us again this year. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Wouldn't miss it. Larry Little, guys, VP of the AIM Expo. More info at aimexpousa.com. And we'll be right back after this commercial break to wrap things up.
Weaving, weaving, criminal act. Oh, look at you, crap. Unbelievable. Never. The front brake. That's the front brake. You saw his front brake slammed on. wrap up the show, we want to wish the best of luck to the top three finishers from the 2016 KTM RC Cup, Brandon Posh, Anthony Maziato, and Ashton Yates. They'll be representing the U.S. in Aston this weekend for the World Cup Final. The AM Expo is coming up October 13th and 16th in Orlando, Florida, as you heard us talk about earlier. Beyond the more than 500 exhibiting manufacturers and aftermarket companies, the show also features a variety of entertainment and networking opportunities. It's open to the media and trade, but also to the public over the weekend. For more information, visit amexpousa.com and download the app while you're at it. It's officially September and we're reaching the end of the summer, prime riding season, but there's still time left to ride. Sport bike track time and N2 track days still have a ton of track days left on the calendar. N2 is running events through the end of November and STT through December. Check them out at sportbiketracktime.com and n2td.org to find your track day today. If you don't want to miss anything from Moto America and AMA Pro Flat Track, be sure to tune in for more this season, including your favorite racers, fast products, Moto America and AMA Pro Flat Track coverage. Don't forget to join the others and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join our newsletter and get this show and more straight to your inbox each Friday. All of us at NMC are avid supporters of our military men and women, and we're proud to support Vet Motorsports, a program that empowers veterans through motorsports. Vet Motorsports helping heal vets through motorsports, and for that, we'd like to thank them. That's all for this week and for the future of motorcycle racing, it's here at Next Moto Champion. is on the horizon. There's still questions and concerns, and we have Moto America partner Chuck Axlin on. Uh, whoops. That could be a problem. <laughs>